right, Circle A, we are back again with our final week of our Listen series. We are wrapping up our Circle A 2022 Legacy Virtual Experience, and we are so excited to have you guys joining us this summer. Um, today's our last day together with this Listen series, and it's been a joy to be with you guys in the process of learning and remembering and growing in our listening skills together. So today we're going to talk about listening up, listening to God. And it's the, we're going to talk about the spiritual implications of our listening and what that means for us as, as humans, as people, and in our growth process. So we talked about the noise, about the cognitive clamor that overwhelms us and that becomes a barrier to our effective listening. And we've talked about turning that down, right? And then we've talked about listening in to ourselves and listening um, in the ways of knowing and in the ways of healing and in the ways of growing. And then we've talked about listening out, listening to others for wisdom and perspective and love. And we've talked about listening as a bridge and listening as a skill and listening as a witness. So today we come to listening up, listening to God. And, you know, in some ways, this is the most obvious of the three, like, yes, of course, we should listen to God, especially if you come from a spiritual background and if you practice the Christian faith, this is a, this seems to be the most obvious and important of the three, right? Certainly the most essential. But in some ways, probably a lot of ways, it can feel like the hardest of the three. Right. And I think the reason why is because God rarely speaks in an audible voice. Right. Our experiences of listening to God are subjective and they're unique to each individual. And sometimes it's pretty hard to sort out the voice of God from our own thoughts and narratives and opinions and ideas and desires. Right. It, it can be hard to sort what's coming from us, what's coming from him. Um, and sometimes it might feel like he's not speaking. He's not speaking to us at all. And that can be pretty hard and pretty painful, especially when we're trying to hear him, right? Matthew eleven fifteen says, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, I appreciate that admonishment, of course, but how do we find the ears to hear? You know, there are times in my life where I have wanted to listen and to understand and felt like I don't know how to find the ears to hear. How do I hear what the Lord is trying to say to me? And it can become pretty hard. So how do we listen to God when it's not as simple as other types of listening? And it can be a whole lot more painful if we don't hear anything, right? That's what we're going to explore today. And I don't think we're going to find all the answers in one short little segment together, but I think we'll find some places to begin to discover those answers for ourselves. So I remember the first time that I heard God speak. For sure, I knew. I knew it wasn't me. I knew it wasn't my dad. I knew it wasn't people around me claiming to be the voice of God. I knew it was God himself that spoke to me. Not in an audible voice. I've never, I've never heard God in an audible voice that I can say specifically, but I have heard God uh, in my life. And so it was just as clear as if it was an audible voice. So I was about 12 years old and we were at uh, some worship and prayer time at Circle A. I think it was right before a session. So the morning before the campers were coming in for a session and we were at a morning worship and prayer time together with the staff, with the LTs, the leadership team at the time, and some of the kitchen staff and the family, we were all there praying together. And I, I had already accepted Christ into my heart as a very young child um, and had been, you know, very exposed to church and camp and God and all of those things for many years of my life. But dad that morning was praying about commitment. I don't remember what the teaching was. I don't remember what context he was even using the word or the idea of commitment, but I do remember that I heard clear as anything, God asking me to commit, to commit my life to him. 
And it wasn't a so that you can be saved sort of commitment because I heard I already done that and already experienced that and already was walking with the Lord in all the ways that I knew to do in my 12 year old self. But it wasn't that sort of a commitment. It was a, a calling sort of commitment. And God was asking me to, whatever I did with my life, to make it for his glory. Um, and I didn't know exactly what that meant at that time. I still don't know exactly what it means. This has been an ongoing journey for me. But I knew that whatever effort I put into the world was meant to be for the glory of God. That's what I knew. And I, I knew I was choosing that as a commitment that day. And, you know, my life didn't radically change in that moment of hearing from God. But I can also tell you that I was never the same and that I have been on a path of figuring out exactly what that means my entire life since. But it was a holy experience of hearing so clearly from God, from a source outside of myself, outside of my family, outside of my church or my community. It was hearing from God. And it's a very special experience. And I pray that each of us receive an experience like that of hearing from God. Um, something that's so clear and so holy that there's no doubt it's from him. So how do we develop ears to hear, to have that sort of experience? Sometimes it may take no development at all. Sometimes it may just be a wholly powerful moment. I probably hadn't developed much ears at that point in my life when I was 12. But I think there is growth work that we can do to be able to hear the voice of God. So perhaps we could work on our listening, listening up in three different ways. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about listening like a mystic, listening like a student, and listening like a friend. A mystic, a student, and a friend. So let's think about this mystic idea for a minute. I've been on the path of the mystic for several years of my life, um, and I hope that I'll continue down that path for the rest of my life, because there is something about seeking God in solitude and in silence that reveals his voice like nothing else will. Um, I think solitude and silence are the best and most complete ways to reduce the cognitive clamor, right? Because if we're, if we're choosing true solitude and silence, which are part of the path of the mystic, we're not just turning down the, the faders on some of the things in our lives, we, we're, we're turning them off. We are removing ourselves completely from other input and experiencing solitude and experiencing silence. And it is transformative. It's very transformative. It's a choice to be still until even the loud noises from inside our own head settle enough to hear from God. So Ruth Haley Barton is one of my very favorite authors on this subject. Um, she has several books that are absolutely fantastic. I recommend the book Invitation to Solitude and Silence if you are interested in exploring the path of the mystic. Um, but she talks about a jar of river water. So if you were to approach a river and scoop a jar into the river, at first you would just see a bunch of water and it would be swirling around because it was just moving from the river and there would be twigs and rocks and dirt in the jar it would be swirling it would be unclear it would be murky you weren't really able to be able to see much in that jar but if you scooped up the jar and you set it down still on the ground and you wait slowly the swirling will come to a stop and the rocks will sink to the bottom and the twigs will sink to the top and the dirt will settle. And if you wait long enough in stillness, the water will become clear. And that's the same idea as listening like a mystic, as practicing solitude and silence and listening. The river water becomes clear as you wait in the stillness. And and clarity is a beautiful thing, right? And in that space is oftentimes where we hear from God. So in order to listen like a mystic, 
we have to remember the damage that cognitive clamor, that the rushing river has done to us. So Henry Nowen puts it like this. He writes, the main function of words, which is communication, no longer is no longer realized. The word no longer communicates, no longer fosters communion, no longer creates community, and therefore no longer gives life. The word no longer offers trustworthy ground on which people can meet each other and build society. And he's right. I mean, he's right. The, the noise has gotten so extreme that words don't hold the power they used to anymore. They don't, right? Perhaps only silence can save us. So he goes on to teach us this. Silence is the home of the word. Silence gives strength and fruitfulness to the word. We can even say that words are meant to disclose the mystery of silence from which they came. When the word calls forth the healing and restoring stillness of its own silence, few words are needed. Much can be said without being spoken. Yes, those words are very mystical, but that's what we're talking about at the moment. And it is a really important piece of listening. So when we listen to God like a mystic, we won't usually hear from him at the beginning of our our mystical time, right? Usually he likes to sit with us in the silence first. Frank Lubach writes this, sometimes you want to talk to your son and sometimes you want to hold him tight in silence. God is that way with us. He wants to hold still with us in silence. Sometimes there's something about just being in the presence of God that prepares us to hear from him first. But first we must wait with him and we must heal with him and we must let him hold us in that space while our jar of river water settles, right? And then Frank Lebach writes, when God is ready to speak, the fresh thoughts of heaven will flow in like a crystal spring. And it's true. It's true. So John 14, 26 reminds us that the spirit is with us. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Those were the words of Jesus. That's the promise of Jesus, that the spirit will be with us and will remind us of what we have been taught by the father, by Jesus, right? The spirit does speak to us and it it is an amazing and holy and wondrous thing that the God, the creator of the universe takes the time, the intention and attention to speak to us individually, individually. To, in our particular circumstances, in our particular moments, he speaks to you and to me. So the question is, are we listening? Are we listening? Silence and solitude, listening like a mystic, hugely important ways to be able to be still enough to hear the voice of God. I could spend a lot more time teaching on that, but we're going to move on to the next portion of the way that we listen to God. And that is to listen like a student, like a student. So my dad always taught me to sit on the front row. Those of you who came to Circle A, I'm sure you've heard him extol the virtues of sitting on the front row when you are here to listen to a teacher, right? And he would teach us to sit right up in the front row with our eyes fixed on the person who was talking, ready to soak in everything they're saying with as little distraction as possible, right? So I did what my dad taught me to do all growing up. I would sit on the front row of seminar at Circle A, unless the seats were signed, then I would sit wherever my notebook was, but you guys know how that went. Um, In school, I did the same thing. And in high school, it wasn't that weird because there was only so many rows in the classroom and somebody had to sit in the front row anyway. So it was me and that wasn't weird. It was just who I was, it was fine. But in college, it got a little more weird, okay? So my husband and I, 
uh, we were dating at the time when we went to college. So I did drag him along with me to all of these front row seats. I will say that. And we would go into these big lecture halls, right? Filled with like three times as many seats as were needed for these classes. And we would go straight up to the front row, front row, middle, right where the teacher was going to be teaching from. It's in the front row every time, right? And then the room would start to fill in. And we'd be like, where's all the other people in the front row? Most people are sitting like a few, few rows back. Does, are we being weird by sitting in the front row? And once in a while, we would run into a class with one of those students. Do you know the type of students I'm talking about? The ones who always get there early and they sit in the front row and they like make friends with the teachers and they bring extra notes and they're, you know, really focused. Those students, well, one day, not too far into college, I realized I was one of those students. <laughs> I was one of those people who sat in the front row, even if I was going to be all by myself. Um, and I did. I wrestled with my pride a little bit about it. I did. And there were a few classes where we like tried sitting like a few few rows back to see how that went. And I'll tell you, I didn't like it. I didn't like sitting part way back in the classroom. I did get distracted by the people sitting in front of me. And I did realize dad was right sitting in the front row, that eye contact, it really did make a difference. So I kept doing it and I was one of those students and I'm proud of it now. But here's the thing, even though I did that in those classes, sat in the front row, looked the teacher right in the eye, took all the notes, that wasn't enough to get me an A in those classes, right? I had to read the books. I had to make the study guides. I had to study my notes for hours, right? To be able to pass the tests that were put in front of me. And even though I was ready to sit on the front row and listen, there was more to being a student than just that, right? So God has given us something to study too. Now, listening to a sermon or a speaker or a teacher talk about God, super great. Super important, very helpful, and it's great to sit on the front row when you're doing that, right? But where do we really listen to him like a student? Well, he gave us his word, right? His actual word, the Holy Scriptures, where there is such a vast, rich wealth of knowledge and history and story and poetry and prophecy and witnesses of the life of Jesus for us to study. And it's an essential resource in our work of listening to God. So if we want to hear the voice of God, then we need to listen like a student by way of our Bibles. So Romans 15, 4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have then Joshua 1.8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now, those passages are intriguing, right? They are in, inviting. They're inviting us to study the scriptures and to read the Bible. But the work of studying doesn't just end by reading passages like that, right? Reading is just the beginning. Because in order to listen like a student, we have to engage what we're reading, right? We have to do the work of understanding what we're reading. We have to ask questions and have conversations and seek counsel of wise people who can help us to make sense of what we're reading, right? So there's a story about the apostle Philip in the Bible, and he met a man along the road. And so we're going to read that from Acts 8. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah, and Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? And the man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. See, this man was wise because he was reading, but he wasn't understanding everything. 
And so he found someone who could help him make sense of these scriptures. And in doing so, he found the story of the gospel and he found Jesus and he became baptized that day. So this is how it is for us too, right? The scriptures are alive and powerful and they do speak to us. They do. It is a way to hear the voice of God. And so I encourage all of us to listen like a student in all of the, in all of those ways, right? All right. Last one. Listen like a friend. Listen like a friend. I recently read a book called Letters by a Modern Mystic um, by a man by Frank, the name of Frank Lubach. And it is a collection of some of the excerpts of his prayer journal um, that he wrote living as a missionary in the Philippines. So he was in the Philippines alone, having to work with a, a really difficult um, tribe of people that he had come to connect with. And so he wrote this journal to kind of detail his experiences there. And so as a part of his time there, he decided he was going to try this experiment and he called it a game of minutes. And during this game of minutes, what his plan was, was to attempt to focus at least one, at least one time per minute, every minute to turn his attention to the spirit of God. So he wrote, I have started out living, or I've started out trying to live all my waking moments in conscious listening to the inner voice, asking without ceasing, what father do you desire said? What father do you desire done this minute? Now, I know that sounds like a mystic's approach, and it is. That is definitely a mystical way to approach the father. But in doing that, in paying that sort of attention to God moment by moment by moment, something begins to develop and it is a friendship. It's an actual relationship between us and God. It's an attention to the spirit that builds that in us. So I would encourage you to read this little book by Frank Lubach and just to be compelled and intrigued by his story and his experiences um, and to practice the presence of God in this way. So Jesus was very clear to his disciples that they were his friends. He said in John 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So God is a friend to us. He's a friend who's faithful and true. He's a friend who always sees the best in us who always offers mercy and grace and compassion and empathy and listening in a way that no one else really ever can. And this friendship that we can form with the God, the creator of the universe is transformative. It's an amazing part of the human experience. And I hope and pray that all of us will choose to embrace this and to move forward into it because it is so essential to who we are as humans and to our calling and work in the world and to our listening to ourselves and others. We also got to listen to God. It's the way that's going to keep us healthy, keep us becoming all that we're created to be. So this Jesus is the best friend that, that we could ever know. And he speaks to us today and every day. So maybe if we think about listening like a mystic in solitude and silence, and we think about listening like a student in studying the scriptures and the teachings of those who follow him, and in listening like a friend in being aware of his presence with us in every moment, then we will experience hearing from God, right? And this idea of hearing from God doesn't have to be a painful thing. Or a confusing thing, it can be a beautiful and transformative thing in our lives. So that's my invitation to you guys today. And I definitely recommend looking up those books, especially uh, the work of Ruth Haley Barton, if you're interested in learning more about this. So I'm really grateful that we've been able to have this time together to talk about listening, to talk about Circle A, and to remember some stories and so many of the things that Skip taught us. Um, and I hope that we're going to have a lot more time like this in the years to come. I want to remind you guys of our session on August 14th. 
Um, it's going to be a, a live session of some sort. We're not exactly sure the format of how it's going to be, but we're going to be talking about some of the things that we've studied this summer in dynamic living, maybe some of the things we've studied in the listen series. And we're also going to be making our announcement about next summer and what's going to happen. And we are planning an in-person summit and you are invited and we would absolutely love, love, love to have you there. So we're going to be able to tell you more about that on August 14th. So please don't miss that session. We'll send it to your emails as well. Um, any feedback that you guys have about this entire summer program that we've put together, the, the Dynamic Living Seminar, the Listen Series, the emails, the bingo chart, any feedback that you have, any ideas that you have, any stories that you have, we really, really are asking. We're not just saying that. We really are asking because our future depends on you. It depends on our community together. And there are so many of us who want to carry on the legacy that Skip left, the legacy of Circle A. And so we're going to work to do that together. And we would love to have you be a part of it. So we look forward to hearing from you and we'll see you on August 14th. We love you guys. Have a great day. 